But here he is, Murat Kunal. I am a man of science. I'm a man of medicine. And um, I believe in them. I live them. Not only I live them, actually, I love them. I love living in science and living in medicine. And, but like Andy, I'm not a factual person, so it doesn't quite uh, go with being a scientist and not being factual. Actually, throughout medical school, I always thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist. Um, but I started dealing with those people who are crazy, and they really are crazy. And as you deal with them, I started losing touch with reality and becoming this weird guy. So m my mom forbid me from becoming a shrink. <laughs> well, I, I love the brain, and I wanted to do something with the brain, but I need to do something practical to keep ties with this world. So I said, what's practical? What's practical? Well, surgery is practical. So I love the brain, surgery. Why not do brain surgery? So that's how I decided to become a brain surgeon <laughs> and traveled over here, and I became a nurse surgeon. And they, t well, everybody thinks neurosurgeons have God complex. And guess what? We do have God complex. How can we not? I mean, think about somebody coming almost dead. You take them to surgery, and they walk out of the hospital, and that feels great. That feels, feels fabulous. And then you f start feeling like God. But it's, that's, not, that's not the whole story. There is other side of the coin, which is sometimes you feel, feel like the lowest creature on earth because you make a mistake, somebody dies. You know, you mess up, it's just, it's a bad, bad feeling. <laughs> so there's, you know, these ups and downs, and you, you have to, um, you have to deal with them. So you learn how to deal with them, and actually, the way I learned to deal with that was, um, I learned it from Al Pacino, from Godfather. I learned the mask face. <laughs> you can put on the mask face and show people not you, what you feel, and you, you can't sometimes, actually, most of the time, especially if things are not going well, you cannot show people how you feel. Because they look at you and they trust you and you have to be strong for them. So I have the mask face and I, I used to think I do a good job with it and I think I, I do a reasonable job with it, but, but not, not a perfect jo job about it. So you deal with these intensities, these ups and downs and the practical aspects of neurosurgery which I call the three B's of neurosurgery which is the blood, brain, and the bone. That's what we do every day. We see blood, we deal with the brain, we take out the bone, put the bone back in, and that's the practical aspect of neurosurgery. But as I said, it's it intense. I mean, it's, it's so hard to deal with it, and you have to do it day in, day out. It's just tough. So you, I at least solve it by creating alternative realities. I tend to travel, I tend to leave out of town, and you feel free. You just need to get out of there, regain your perspective, come back to town, and deal with it again. So it's one of those evenings that I'm getting ready to pack. I'm in the office. I'm happy. I'm singing. I'm about to go out of town. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. I get this phone call from, from the resident from the emergency room that there's this trauma case. I immediately interrupt him. I, interrupt him. I, I go like, I'm not on call. Call the on-call attending. And the resident goes, well, actually, I did. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, the patient is a young patient, has bad trauma, extensive skull fractures, and a big bleed. I happen to do vascular neurosurgery, which is the bleeds and the vessel problems, all, all kinds of intense, crazy stuff that nobody else wants to do. So the on-call on attending thought, because it was such an extensive trauma, that it was a good case for me. So now I have to make a choice. I was going to go get out of town and be free, or it's somebody's life, all right? So as I'm cursing at my fate, I look at the CAT scan and see the skull, which is fractured like eggshells, and extensive bleeds in the brain. And I tell the residents to take the patient to the OR, and I start walking down the hallway. And I'm now I'm angry. I'm pissed off. I cannot leave town again. I have to deal with this. And I walk in the OR as they're putting the patient to the operating table, and the whole world changes. Now all you see is this young kid on the OR table bleeding, and you focus you focus on the patient, you focus what you have to do. And again, the whole, the color of the world changes. So we make the incision and um, we start seeing what the CAT scan showed, which is his skull is broken like an eggshell. There are extensive fractures all over the place. And um, we start going, making our way through that, trying to take out these bone pieces, which are stuck to the brain. And you have to pick up all these bones and make, 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 make way 
And as we are doing this, we start seeing um, quite a bit of bleeding. It's pretty extensive bleeding. And um, there's a structure on, on top of the, uh, of, the, of the brain called the sagittal sinus, which is a large, large vessel. And that is very hard to reconstruct if there's damage to that. And that's why like, it's very difficult to separate Siamese twins. And um, as we are making our way, as we've seen in the CAT scan before, there are extensive fractures on the top of his brain affecting the structure. So we start taking them out, but there's quite extensive bleeding, and you, there are 20 people in the room running around, and you yell at the anesthesiologist, keep up with the blood work, they're trying to do everything they can, and they are mainly giving intravenous fluids, which are clear, to keep up with the blood loss. But it gets to an extent, of course we don't know his blood type yet, that we have to give him blood because IV fluids are not keeping up with the bleeding. So the only thing you can do is gi give him all negative blood, which is not matched to his blood type. So there's an extent that you can give, but you do whatever you can. So they start pouring as much as they can, the all negative blood. Now, brain actually is very dumb. Brain, whether that is a tumor, a bleed, a stroke, anything, responds by swelling. It swells like a sponge. So at this point, we are losing so much blood, and it's, we cannot keep up with it because his sagittal sinus, this big vessel, is, is damaged all from the front to the back. So um, as they give fluids more and more, the brain actually starts swelling. And that is a very, very bad feeling. You feel nauseated to your, to your stomach because there's very few things you can do to stop that swelling. And um, it starts coming almost like a toothpaste. And that is reversible to an extent that the brain sort of sticks out. But after that, it starts basically tearing itself and you have irreparable damage. And as this is happening, his blood pressure starts going down, his heart rate starts going down, and we cannot give him more blood because we don't know his blood type yet. So it gets to a desperate situation where you are you know, r going frantic and everybody's doing their best, but patient is just not responding and there's not much you can do. And it gets to a point where you realize that they, there might not be something else that you can do and you sort of like feel, as I said, the lowest creature on earth. And something um, even more terrible happened than this brain coming out of it, which I've never seen or heard before and I, I hope I will never see is that because we were pouring so many, so much, so fast, these IV fluids, which are again clear fluids, the color of his blood that was oozing from the wound start changing color. So it changed from a dark red, which is a normal color, to a bright red, and it start turning pink. And now, now you're feeling desperate. Now you, you, you have no idea. That now you know the patient is not gonna make it. I mean, you can, it's just not gonna make it. So the whole, um, the whole idea changes. You, s you don't know quite what to do. You s you're starting to sort of push the limits of your imagination what you can do. And I remembered from my internship days when we do general surgery that when there's a belly trauma, like when the liver is bleeding, because you cannot coagulate the liver to stop the bleeding, the only thing you can do is basically pack the, um, pack the belly with sponges. So I just grabbed this pack of sponges and just put on the kid's brain and I put two of my hands on top of that and I, I could feel the pulsation of the brain which is actually is a great thing because the, one of the again bad feelings is not to feel that pulsation and I can see the fluid tr through my fingers around my fingers it's still pink and his blood pressure is dropping and his heart is dropping and now you yell that we're just losing him and everybody's doing but it's just a very tense environment and there's not much else you can do. When you get to that point, it just becomes a situation where you just want to help the family. And um, all you can think of is basically try to close the skin, get to the patient to the intensive care unit, give the family enough, enough time to say goodbye to him when, there is, when he's living, which helps a lot with the griefing process with the family. Because I think it's very tough if, some, if you lose somebody in the, um, in the operating table. So we made the decision that we're going to try to keep him alive for one more hour and have the family see him, say goodbye, and then we're going to lose him. As we're doing that, as my hands are feeling the pulsation, the actually blood arrived, which, which was matched. 
So we start pouring the blood to him, and of course at this time he's not clotting because he lost all his clotting factors through the bleeding. We start pouring all the blood products, and slowly he starts, he starts coagulating his blood. He slowly, by you, on the spine, just starts forming a clot, and the bleeding starts slowing down, the brain starts calming, and the, and the color of the blood starts again turning to this red, uh, dark red. So all we have to do now is get him into the ICU, find the family, have the family say goodbye, and that's that. We staple the skin as quick as we can. You have a very little short, short time. We rush him to the intensive care unit, and as I'm putting my mask on to go talk to the family, and again, you have to be strong for them, um, I ask the residents what the story was. Turns out that this is a 16-year-old uh, college kid who was going in the evening to back to college because the final tomorrow is the winter night, and they skid along the road. He was a passenger, unrestrained, so he flew to the windshield, and that's, the, um, that's why he got the uh, eggshell fractures throughout his skull. So I hear the story, you don't want to hear anymore, you don't want to get emotional. I, I go down to the waiting room, take a deep breath and enter. There's 20 people and they're surrounding this woman who's um, on the floor and he's, he, she's on her knees and crying and begging. I, I sort of didn't quite get what was going on first but as the people sort of moved around, I see this woman on the floor and um, she's begging and I, as I approached her to tell her um, which is obviously a very, very tough thing that her kid is not going to make it, but she should go up to the ICU and say goodbye to him. She, she basically held on to me and she started begging, begging at me, don't let my son die. And um, I'm trying to find the strength to say it. Open my mouth, she doesn't let me talk. And I, a, anything that I try to say it just doesn't, doesn't happen. So she, she's begging and begging, and I didn't have the strength to tell her at that point that he wasn't going to make it. So I held on to her, we went upstairs, and I was trying to explain to her that there was extensive bleeding that we tried to control, left the sponges on the brain to control the bleeding, but I don't think she was hearing me, and I don't think she wanted to hear me. So I left the family to say goodbye, and we're pouring the blood products and doing everything we can, and I, I came back a couple hours later to see that he was somewhat stabilized with his vital signs, which still this, his um, blood oozing from all the incision and everything else, and we basically replaced his blood volume a couple times probably that night. Next morning he's more stable, but I need to go talk to the family because I've never seen such an extensive brain injury to recover or have any chance to recover. But the scans show that there's not an extensive stroke, so I guess there's some reason to give some more time to the family, again, that you have to go through the grief process and be there with the family. So day one like that, and day, day two like that. And finally on day three, the CAT scans don't again show extensive stroke or anything like that. And mom is just not hearing anything. Mom is just like, wants everything to be done, wants the sponges out, wants everything. I explained to mom that most likely we're not gonna be able to get the sponges out because we won't be able to reconstruct this big, big vessel here, the sagittal sinus, but she pushed me to do that. So on day three, we took her, took, took took the boy to surgery, and under the microscope, hours and hours, millimeter by millimeter, we removed these sponges and basically reconstructed the sinus the best we can. Left big drains in and um, closed the skin and, and, and came up. He did fine, and after um, six months in the intensive care unit, and I, I think three or four surgeries later, he was able to go to the rehab. He came back a year later, still significantly affected, barely talking, but two years later, he went back to his college. And now looking at, at, back at it, you know, after, after all this time, I feel like we did what we did, and we did what we could, but it was the, um, it was the bond between the mom and the son that saved the boy's life. And I, I cannot explain that. But I think that the unexplainable what we deal with is, is the thing that is the um, art of medicine. It is the art in medicine and probably art in science. And I think um, that's what makes it all worthwhile. Thank you.